and welcome to episode 206 of The Psych Files. And I'm your host, Michael Britt. In this episode, we have a very special interview with a young man named Alex Lowry. And Alex is going to talk about his life growing up with autism. Here I am talking to Alex, and his mother, Sylvia, is in the background there. You'll hear her. She answers some of the questions as well. Without any further ado, let's go straight to the interview with Alex Lowry. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I've seen some of your videos. You're clearly really comfortable uh, talking to people. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about some of your earliest memories about school growing up? Okay. I'll start with early memories, shall I? Is that the name of your school? I could not pronounce that. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Yes, Carl Brondoff. <laughs> what, uh, what language is that? Is that English? I think it's Welsh. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> well, okay. So tell us about it. What was that like going to school? That was with <laughs> other kids who had autism? Yeah, it was all for children at Austin. When I first started going, the first day, I was like terrified. I, I found all, like all the children there and all the teachers. I just find it really scary. I screamed to get out. And once I started actually, you know, going into the lessons, uh, the school lessons, I didn't like with the teacher there. She used to try to stop me from stimming. I did a lot of uh, a lot of movements like hand flapping and squeezing hands. Yeah, she used to say to me, "Good hands, Alex. Good hands." When you were what? Not doing it, or when you were doing? Oh, when you were when doing was, it. So yeah, when I was doing it, she was saying I just had good hands. Oh, that's yeah, when she wanted you to put your hands down. Then. Yeah, 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 yeah. There were some parts that, of the school I really liked, though, like the food. The cook there, she was called Manon. She did. I thought she did fantastic meals. Um, I used to always say to my mom, Manon's a good cook. She's the best cook than you. Right now, you're how old? I'm 20 now. And so you're talking about when you were going to school, so you're four or five at this point? I only went to school for about, I think it was two years. Uh, yeah, I was like five to about seven, I think, when I was at school, yeah. And then I moved out to be home educated. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So you're, or you, we would say your mom, but you say your mom over there is educating you. Uh, well, yeah, but I also had therapists coming over to teach me, um, to teach me a lot of skills and, um, of course, do the applied behavioral analysis. Right. Okay. Yeah. I definitely wanted to get to that. But what do you remember? Any of the other children at the school? Do you remember them? Or yes, I do remember them. Obviously, this was a long time ago, so I don't remember them vividly, but I remember I used to be scared of some of the children there because they, they like, um, chased me around and often, like, scratched and bit, bit and that kind of thing, and that really frightened me, especially when one of them sat next to me. There was one boy who actually had less language than I had. I didn't have as much language as I have now, but I did have um, some language. But he didn't have... This boy had no language at all. However, he could read and write, um, as I couldn't read and write. And he could also write to communicate. He could actually communicate to people through uh, writing. Uh, and there was another the girl who was, like, really sociable as well. And she tended to bring me out of myself. All right, so can you tell us a little bit about what it was like when you were younger? I mean, I've been reading some of the book that you're working on. It really gives us a good sense of the things. you, you uh, Loud noises would bother you, for example. You know, what, what was it like growing up? Well, when I was like three to four years old, I found the world like a terrifying place. I found going into shops extremely scary. Uh, I found it scary for a lot of reasons. One was like the dummies. I found the dummies. I thought they were like real headless people. And the mannequins. Oh, yeah, the mannequins. I also found uh, the pop music really scary that was in the shops or whatever the music was that was playing. And I found the lights scary. I thought the lights on the ceiling had pop stars above them on the roof singing. And I was also scared of the, all the people that were walking around. Certain features of people would often be exaggerated to me. Like if someone had a long nose, to me, it would seem like extra long. And if someone had a high forehead, it would seem really high to me. Um, to add to all of this, I also spoke my own language most of the time. I thought others could understand me, but when they didn't, that got me maybe really frustrated and it resulted in a lot of extreme behaviour. And what do you remember about that language? Do you remember, like, what words you used for certain things? I mean, how, how... I'm trying to imagine what having your own language would be like. I did use set words for certain things. I used a bit of echolalia, which is kind of like repeating things that I've heard. When I got really stressed, I think I sometimes said, tummy ache. And I sometimes also said, I want my head off, because I was frustrated at, at not being able to communicate at all. So, yeah, I, I said a few key things, but um, I mainly spoke in my own language. It was just gobbledygook, really, that his own language. Yeah. So how long, for example, that expression, want my head off, did your parents understand 
at that after a while? Did they, they know that that meant you were frustrated? Did you man up? Yeah, obviously, if your child's on the floor scratching their face and going, I want my head off, <laughs> you think they're frustrated and they're really angry. And, you know, we took him to doctors and the doctors would be, I've got a tummy ache. They would physically examine him and there'd be nothing wrong. He was about, what, four when you... Four, yeah, three or four. Up until, up until three and a half, although Alex would scream all night, we used to have to sort of play Thomas the Tank Engine to him all night, the video, and, and he'd sort of stop crying. And the minute the, minute the film stopped, you'd think, oh, you know, and he'd start again. <laughs> so you had to keep replaying Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> Everybody got to hear Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, but he would sort of have, he talks about it in his book, we have bad, I had a bad night or screaming. He would wake up in a trance. And, and you really, really, it was really hard to be hard to break him out of it. And the only way you could break him out of it was to put Thomas on. After a time, he would sort of calm down a bit with Thomas. But, um, yeah. Uh, but it was, it was terrible. Yeah. I don't remember much of it. Yeah, my, my memories of that time are very vague, actually. So you don't remember why you were screaming? What was it that was well, bothering you? Yeah. It was mainly because, I think, because I was, like, frustrated. I uh, think part of the reason why I screamed was because, like, a lot of things scared me. You know, I was in a, a, very, a very terrifying world. But also, I was frustrated that no one seemed to be understanding me at all. Like, everyone else seemed to be understanding each other, but no one understood me. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, it, if that make, does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah. Also, clothes. He clothes, yeah. His clothes off and Paper, I think. Yeah, yeah, a lot of clothes that uh, make me feel uncomfortable. Um, I only wore things like loose jogging trousers and t-shirts. Yeah, I think I remember uh, you saying in one of your videos that it was a tweed that used to really annoy you. Was that what it was? Some kind of clothing used to annoy you, and I think the uh, the price tags or the little things that we have in the back of our shirts used to really annoy you. Yeah, um, I hated labels on the back of, of shirts and that kind of thing. Yeah, they, 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 they felt like needles. Uh, maybe thistles or that kind of thing, or needles. Uh, they felt really painful to me. Um, and I also didn't like the badges that were sewed on T-shirts. They felt really uncomfortable. So you had really heightened senses. Is that, is that what I'm getting? Uh, you know, your sounds, noises, even images, even what we what many people would consider normal would be heightened and, and uh, really annoying to you. Yeah, I was hypersensitive to a lot of things. And then what happened to that then? As you got older, did that just kind of fade away? Or how did that change? I've, um, I've been brought into these environments, so I have improved a lot. But my senses can still be kind of mixed up. Certain noises still irritate me quite a bit. For example, not long ago on our fridge, yeah, sorry, there were some pan lids that were sort of hung up. And every time the fridge opened, they made this horrible noise. And I found that noise really irritating. I found it just torture to to hear every time I open the fridge. But I told my mum about this and she said, what noise? Didn't hear any noise. <laughs> what noise do you mean? Mm-hmm. And I was like, what noise? How can you not know what noise I mean? Um, it was torture. I also don't like, so yeah, certain noises still, I still don't like. And I also don't like to be touched, really. Um, it often makes me feel uncomfortable um, to be touched. And certain clothes I still don't like. Like, I don't like, I don't much like to wear a tie. Yeah, I don't blame you there. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes to wear a tie. <laughs> I really struggle to explain why I don't like to be touched, but it, I just feel uncomfortable with it. And when the, hand, when the hand is removed, I often feel like I can still feel it. I feel like it's almost left a mark on me. A bit like when you put a hand in paint, then put it on paper. Um, but even though the hand is removed off the paper, the, the paint, um, it's still left an imprint on the hand. But, uh, I kind of feel a bit like that when people touch me. Now, how about music? So at first, when you were younger, it was noise. How is it different now? I don't get irritated by every noise now. And when I go into shops, I cope with, you know, I don't, I don't um, go screaming because of uh, the loud noises, how, uh, because of the loud music. However, if, if I go to a place where, where there's music that's extremely loud, like if there's some pop music or whatever, that's like the, the volume's turned right up and there's flashing lights, I still don't really like that kind of thing. You know, like if it's at a disco or something. But I haven't been to many of them. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to shops... I don't really have a problem with them now. So it just kind of faded away as you got old. Well, yeah, it's 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 improved. Certain ways I can still you know have a problem with 
with noise. I can still like you know be sensitive to certain noises, but it's not the same extent. And how do you think you're obviously very articulate? So how have you gone from one, two, three word phrases to you know you talk like anybody? Uh, again, just sort of slowly happened over time. Did it happen through some of the programs? I know you mentioned you were you went through something called the Learning Breakthrough Program and Audio Box. I've, I've never heard of those. Maybe you want to tell us what those are. I should probably say that a lot of these questions, I've had to like practice answering them so that I understand everything that's being asked. Yeah, I know. I've asked, asked a few questions at once, haven't I? Yeah, go ahead. About how I've managed to improve in these areas. I think being taught how to talk has, has helped with that. But the audio blocks and the learning breakthrough program. Basically, with the learning breakthrough program, I'll start with that one. Um, with this, basically, you stand on like this balancing board and um, you have to hit a ball that's on a string. Different activities to do with hitting a ball. You could like maybe hit it with a stick, hit it with certain parts of your body. It, there's different activities to do. Basically, these activities basically help um, the parts of a person's brain that aren't working as... Parts of the brain that are working well to help the parts of the brain which aren't working as well to connect up together. And um, this is called brain plasticity. Um, but this, like, this did help me a lot. Once I had finished this program, I felt like I was processing things much quicker. Do you remember any of the other exercises? So, I mean, that sounds like a balance exercise, right? <laughs> it sounds difficult. You have to stand on a board and, and hit a ball on a, that's on a string. Are there other exercises like that? Well, most of them were to do with hitting the ball, but there were, there were different activities. One was like, they maybe like swing the ball around around the room and you have to keep your eyes on it without taking your eyes off it. And balance. Yeah, and at the same time as balance on the board, yeah. <laughs> Did you get sick? <laughs> yeah, well, if it wasn't difficult, then it wouldn't help connect. You know, um, difficult things, things that are hard to do, help you to actually help you. If it takes effort to do them and you work at them, then that can be a good thing. And that can actually help. It's interesting. I'll have to look into that. I'm curious as to what the theory is behind that. I mean, what is, uh, what exactly is that supposed to do? Well, my other daughter, who has dyslexia, she did it, and she didn't stick at it. But she, she actually said that when she finished doing the half hour program, she would actually feel. Um, and she's very clever. She's a radiographer, but she had dyslexia. But she would feel like um, after she'd done it. Like her brain, she could read it faster, like she could recall things quick, more quickly after it. So it did make her feel feel better, but then it would wear off. I mean, Alex did it for two years every day. Yeah, she's dyslexic, so there wasn't the same need. But it wasn't really for your language, was it, Alex? It was more for reading and those kind of things. In terms of language, starts with non-verbal imitation and it moves on and it teaches language in a very structured way and it teaches recall and it has lots and lots of programs. It's, it's very intense. And um, you know, people always always focus with ABA on the you're giving a reward, you're giving a reinforcement, but it's a very intense systematic program of teaching. So you think it's ABA program that help mostly with the language? You can't take someone and say, oh, here's a magic trick to help someone gain language. I mean, when Alex got to four, I'd been worried about him talking in his own language and worried about, you know, what was happening. And I asked a speech therapist who was, she was a student. And after six months, she came back and said, I think I know what Alex might have. And it was something called somatic pragmatic disorder. So I sort of took this somatic pragmatic disorder, which I don't know if you've heard of it, but, you know, it, it's focusing more on a language disorder rather than autism. But I looked it up and instantly autism came up and looked at the list of autism, you know, all the sort of signs and thought, you know, we're dealing with autism here. But one of the things her little sheet from college said is that when the child is talking in their own language, you have to say, no, we don't understand what you're saying. Can you, you know, so you have to make it clear each time they use their own language that you're not understanding. And I think that was the point when the frustration about the language happened with Alex. And he started screaming endlessly from morning to night in pure frustration. And he would attack himself or us if we got near. But I think, I think at the end of six months of doing this, he did actually start 
using some language. You know, I suppose once you realise you've got a problem, and also I think I, I think a person with autism needs to be taught language in a very straightforward way. Whereas we expect children, children just pick up language generally, don't they? And I think once you start putting that in place, but. A friend, I was desperate, what do I do? And a friend who was a special needs teacher said, oh, you know, have a special box and just pick up a teapot and talk about everything to do with the teapots. You know, so we would talk about everything in a very simple way. And I think Alex's language did start to come before we even started the ABA. Obviously, the ABA helped a lot. There's not a specific thing that you can say really is, is a magic cure. And I, I think there probably is something in some individuals with autism where they can learn language but there are others who I know who've had ABA programs all their childhood and never gained language so you know it's, it, there is no guarantee it could still that. help in other ways it helps in other ways so you've had a lot of ABA, you've had this learning breakthrough program the audio blocks or what it's called yeah blocks. and what is that that's basically that, that has a, a similar effect the learning breakthrough program Basically, the audio blocks, they, it's blocks. It's not with um, a ball and a board. You have certain things to do with blocks. You might be told to tell the list of coloured blocks to put on the table, and you have to remember every colour to put on the table. And it has different activities like that to do with blocks. Like the Learning Breakthrough Programme, it basically helps the part of the brain which um, is working well to affect the part of the weaker areas. It has a similar effect to the um, Learning Breakthrough Programme. So these blocks, they don't actually make sounds. No, 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 no. Somebody yeah, said audio classic. blocks. I thought, oh, blocks must have music in them. Or something. I think the reason why it's called audio is because you have to still listen to instructions. You have to listen to audio. I mean, there, there was a CD, a CD one that came with it that you put on, and that had certain audio things on it, and it told you to do certain things. So uh, that was some. That was a talking thing. So you had to follow directions about how to remember the order of the blocks and put them in that order on a table. Is that what you're saying? Is part of it? Well, I did, um, it didn't tell you how to. It just told you to put the... Um, it built up yeah. the memory, so it yeah. start with remembering four blocks and you'd get right up to being able to remember 20 blocks, all the colours. Um, and then it would also have things like... And mem memorising a list like the Kings and Queens of England, but alternating it by counting backwards in... Or, you know, or counting up in twos or something like that. So, and, and this worked more with my husband after the stroke. When he had done that kind of exercise, his language would be a lot better for, for like an hour and then eventually it became permanent. You would see the difference after he'd done that kind of exercise. What do you think's the idea behind this approach? Um, obviously it's neuroplasticity, but I think it's connecting the two parts of the brain. <coughs> I mean, obviously, nobody really knows what causes autism, do they? I mean, there is research that has suggested that... Genetics. Or not just the... But in terms of the way a person with autism brain works, it's the connections that aren't quite working as well as a typical brain. But obviously, the, the exercises... I mean, it's certainly... It's improving specific deficits. Uh, I mean, Alex's memory is really, really low. And in a recent IQ test, Alex's memory was really within the normal range, so that made quite a difference. And if your memory is better, then you can function better, can't you? So, you know, if it's, if it's working on specific deficits, then it's, 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 imp it's making improvements. I'm going to have to do a little digging on those two approaches. Now, Alex, there's, there's been a, a huge discussion on our, the Facebook group, and I don't really want to go into it on and on, but we probably should talk about facilitated communication because it is what everybody talks about. You've tried it, though, right? I'm not going to go on about it for loads because I don't, I don't really know a lot about facilitated communication, really. I don't hardly anything about it. I will still say that I think any means of a person with autism being able to like talk or be, you know, be able to speak be able to communicate is good. So if they're, you know, they're able to communicate through typing or, or anything like that, um, I think if that's a way of expressing themselves, then I think that's that's always a good thing. I don't know about facilitated communication itself, but I, don't, but I think there's definitely been cases where a non-verbal person with autism has understanding. 
and they can actually use other types of communication to express themselves. Yeah, the controversy is surrounds how much the facilitator is directing the child to type things that really they might not type otherwise. So it's a an ongoing kind of kind of issue. Because every, yeah, I agree. It's I, what I was talking with Paul Brody in the last episode. The communication aspect with his brother, you know, not knowing what he might be thinking or trying to communicate, is is frustrating all around. And so the idea that you might be able to find a way to communicate with someone who's having those kinds of troubles is obviously really exciting. But we want to make sure we get it right. Yeah. Well, you know, this morning I was reading your uh, great blog post about some of the myths that people have. The myth about every autistic kid has great talent. And I'm sure that's because of the media, right? You, you The Rain Man thing. Or you see an autistic child who can play the piano unbelievably. So what are some of these myths? Because this is something that you talk about, right? Because I know one of the things that, that you've been doing and definitely should do more because of how articulate you are is, is public speaking. So what is it about that particular myth? Do autistic people have incredible talents? Well, I wasn't saying that nobody with autism has, you know, an extraordinary ability like a lot of people think they do. Like a lot of people say, uh, like when they hear about it on the news and that kind of thing. There are a few that actually do have an amazing ability. However, st- if you take everybody with autism into consideration, the ones who have extraordinary abilities, uh, you f- they're very rare to find. In fact, I'm not sure that this is true, but I've heard that oh, there's only about 100 savants in the world. However, I do know that a lot of time people with autism will have gifts and will have great abilities that you know you don't find in other people, but they, it's rare to have an extraordinary ability, like say, be able to hear a piece of music once and be able to play it perfectly precisely on the piano, or to be able to see a building and draw it perfectly precisely, or be able to uh, say what day of the week a person was born on. These are like, they're the, they're the gifts that I'm talking about. It's rare to find abilities that are that extraordinary, if you get what I mean. But um, when a person finds out that someone has autism, sometimes their question is, okay, what ability do you have? You know, so. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> the other one I saw on your list of myths is, well, look at you. I mean, you talk so well and you quote unquote look normal. You probably don't have autism. How do you respond to that? Well, I'd say that just because um, a person can talk and looks normal, that doesn't mean they don't have autism. I mean, people with autism all have communication problems, but that doesn't mean that they're not, they, they can't talk at all. I mean, some people with autism are nonverbal, but not all are. They'll have some degree of language difficulty. Like, I have a hard time sometimes, I, I sometimes don't understand what other people are saying. People can still misinterpret what I say, so it's still language difficulty. And about looking normal, well, autism is a hidden disability. So physically, you can't usually tell that someone has it just by looking, just by their physical appearance. It's purely based on behaviour. But some people, even though a lot of people have said that I don't look like I behave autistic, that's mainly because of a lot of my therapy has helped me to try and control my, my autistic behaviours. Like a lot of the stimming and that kind of thing, I've learned to control them in public. Yeah, the comments that are made by, you know, you don't come across like you have autism, they're usually from people who don't really know who they are, or don't, and obviously don't know a lot about autism. Yeah, we talked about this spectrum, and most people have got the extremes in their heads. You know, they, they've, they've got the rain yeah. man, uh, the person who plays the piano, the th- you know, the, the, the fingers in front of the face. That, that's the image that they have in their head. So someone like you is not the image. I've seen some of the videos of you in front of people. Now, speaking in front of people, it's, uh, you know, from having had students do presentations in front of class for years. I mean, they, some of them get really, really nervous. You look pretty, pretty at ease in front of people. How did you get to that point? Uh, basically, I'm, I'm just used to doing speeches now. But when I first started doing public speaking, I, I didn't feel comfortable doing them, really. I, I did feel extremely nervous and anxious about doing it. I didn't want to. I actually felt like I just wanted to not do it, the speeches. But I just didn't let my nerves take over me. I just hid the fact that I was nervous and pretended to be doing it really well. But I have, but I'd always practiced a lot beforehand. 
like I'd practice like saying what I wanted to say about autism. Uh, I'd often record this, me doing the speech at my own house, and then watch watch it and see how I could improve the next time, and then record this again, and then I'd start memorizing it. So I knew the speech really well, and then I just do what I had learned from other people and try and imagine that I wasn't that there wasn't any audience. So that's basically how I controlled my nerves. For most of the speeches that I do now, I'm not really that nervous. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous, but not that because I'm not that nervous because I'm I'm just used to doing public speeches. Really, college students have to do them, <laughs> so they they you know, they have to conquer their fears, and they actually do with a lot of what you're saying, which is they record themselves and you know they practice. But you don't have to do this. Where did this idea come from? You, when did you say, oh, I'm going I'm to stand up and I, I'm going to tell people what, I, what, what they need to know about autism? Why, why did you decide to do this? Well, basically, I, I was already, I, I basically started by doing YouTube videos about autism, like recording myself making, saying certain things about autism. And it, at one time, I was asked to do a speech. And even, even though I really didn't want to, um, for quite a few reasons, A, I didn't, I didn't want to do a speech in front of people, but also I didn't want to do, I especially didn't want to do it in front of people I knew really well. Well, not knew really well, but who, I, who knew me, kind of. I didn't want to do that. But I had this feeling like, well, this is an opportunity to actually tell people about autism and to actually help them to understand so I should actually use this opportunity to my advantage and actually do the speech. And soon after I got the opportunity, I was, um, tr- I was eventually trained in, in public speaking by through autism in Cymru. Um, Cymru is, we- is uh, Welsh for Wales. You were trained how? I was trained in public speaking through an organisation called Autism in Cymru. Um, they gave me a lot of tips in public speaking and I, was, and I did a couple of speeches for them. And I just ended up getting more and more opportunities to speak. And do people come after you? So have you become a little bit of a celebrity? People come up after you. Can I ever autograph anything like that? <laughs> not, 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 not quite. <laughs> not yet. I bet they will, though. So what organizations do you speak to? I speak for loads of different organizations. I've spoken for, like, the Welsh Assembly. I've spoken for the National Autistic Society. The last one that I did was for Finch County Council. Yeah, I've spoken for quite a few big organizations. I've spoken for, like, a school. I, yeah, I speak to loads of different organizations really, and different venues. Now, your website is uh, Alex Lowry. That's L-O-W-E-R-Y dot co dot U-K. And yeah. uh, so that's cool. So if people want to see more videos of you. Now, you're, right, you're working on a book. Yes. The book I've actually finished. It's actually written, but we're in the process of the publishers. We've asked one publisher. Um, we haven't got back to us yet, though. Is it about what you want people to know about autism? Basically, it's my life story from like when I was like three years old and um, finding the world a terrifying place up to starting from business this year. And yeah, I try to go into like the struggles I've had with autism and the progress I've made. I really hope this book can help people understand autism. I hope it can help parents, autistic children to understand their children better and, and um, people who work with people who have autism. And I hope it can help people with autism themselves um, you know, to understand themselves better. Have you sat down with any young people with autism? You know, just said, hey, listen, I understand. A little bit. I mean, sometimes I have sometimes sp- uh, spoken to a person or two about difficulties and, like, said, like, okay, like, how my traits are similar to theirs. I did a speech for autistic people at, in a high school. Uh, that was one of the speeches I did. And they seem to respond well to it. What, what, is it, what are your thoughts about, you know, where are you going to go from here? What is it you're thinking about doing career-wise? I don't know at the moment, but I think my plans for the moment are just to continue with public speaking. I hope that I can just continue to grow in this business, and um, I hope to help. I hope to continue to help others understand autism. You know, I think I think this is a, a good job, which actually which actually suits me quite well. I kind of like struggle to do a normal job, and it'd be hard to find a job that would actually suit me. I mean, in this country, I'm not sure about America, but in the UK, it was actually only like 15% of people with autism are in full-time paid employment. So, yeah, I think setting up, going up in business is something which, you actually, which you're actually good at, I think, can often be the best, can be the best thing. But um, I still have a lot of support with my business, though. Um, my mother helps me quite a lot in, in my... Um, in the, in the stuff that I do. Um, and my dad is in charge of the financial side. And my sister-in-law, it, she designs, like, the website and uh, a lot of the business cards and that kind of thing. Yeah. 
Oh, she's good because the website is really nice. It is fantastic. Well, yeah, you should you should definitely. Uh, I mean, I'm not the only one who's taken with the uh, with the accent. You know, us Americans are just real suckers for. The accents over there. <laughs> we just love it. <laughs> yeah. We're kind of used to American accents because we, you know, because we're used to films and that kind of thing. So, <laughs> yeah, I bet you are. For us, it's weird. We see we we when we see someone on uh, one of our shows who speaks, you know, with an American accent, and then you see that person in an interview and he and he speaks like you. It's like, oh, jeez, it's so it's so weird. But anyway, that's that's an aside. I, you know, you got so much going for you aside from you know how well you speak. Or you're a handsome young man. I, I think, I, mean, I think you'll see a lot of success in these in the public speaking. Well, listen, I appreciate the time. Uh, this has been great. I, I've learned so much between talking with you and and Paul Brody. I mean, it's there's a lot people have to know. You know, we've got to get ourselves past the uh, you know the, the Rain Man stereotype. And, yes. and understand autistic people as individuals. Sometimes that's hard, but I think you're going to help a lot. Thank you. All right. Well, this is great talking to you. And, and your, uh, that's your mom back there, right? Yes. <laughs> or as you say, my mother. <laughs> Thank you. I, I've enjoyed the podcast a lot. Thank you for, for doing it. Yep. Okay. Take care, Alex. See you. Bye. And Alex is mom. Bye. Wonderful interview. Both very, very charming folks. Uh, again, I apologize for some of the squeaky noises on my side. Clearly, I need some new equipment, so I'm working on that. I also wanted to mention that Alex can also do his talks over the Internet. So you can use Skype or even Google Hangouts. In fact, last year I did a talk over Skype for high school class. We talked about mnemonics, of course, but it worked great. Now, you only heard the audio part of this interview, but I was actually seeing Alex and his mother uh, through Skype. And as I mentioned, very charming people, and he is just great on camera. So if you're interested in that, again, check out his website, alexlowry.co.uk, and see when he's available. And he's got links there to his YouTube page, Twitter page, Facebook page. Really a neat guy, and I'm sure that he would be happy to talk to your group as well. Okay, everybody, take care. Bye now.